I was thinking about uh, a topic. Does anybody know the shortest verse in the Bible, in the entire Bible? Anyone know what that is? Jesus wept would be the shortest verse, John eleven thirty five. Now, that's in English, in Greek. I remember it's in 1 Thessalonians 5. It's, uh, uh, what is the, I think it is, uh, uh, pray without ceasing. It's three words in English, but it's only two words, and they're shorter letters in Greek. But uh, what about the shortest verse in the Bible? Anybody know? Well, it's Psalm 117. How about the longest chapter in the Bible? Shortest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 117. It's obviously the shortest psalm. The longest chapter in the Bible, anybody know? What, who, what somebody say it? 119. What about the middle chapter of the entire Bible? Anybody have a hint? Psalm 118. Interesting. 117 is the shortest chapter in the entire Bible. 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And all of a sudden, it's very interesting, between those two, in the middle, is the middle chapter of the Bible. If you were to count all the chapters in the Bible, after Psalm 118, there are 594 chapters before this psalm, and there are 594 chapters after this psalm. Now, I find that fascinating. Do you think it's just a coincidence? See, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think God works providentially, obviously, uh, in preserving the Bible and having Books that originally were separate books. They were separate books. Some of them were letters, individual letters. And God providentially worked, you can say miraculously maybe, but I think it was just, it was divine uh, operation, but it was providentially preserving all those books and, and somehow we don't know how. They all got together. People knew where they came from. They knew that Paul wrote these letters to Corinth, or Paul wrote these letters to Ephesians. They knew uh, about uh, the book of Psalms. These are uh, actually uh, original, we'll talk about it in a minute, they were hymn books. They were hymn books. And I don't think it's just a coincidence. Uh, it's not mere chance because if you knew how the Bible was put together, not only the books, but even the division into chapters, uh, it is something that proves that that God is working providentially even in, even in translations of the Bible. Nothing is, of course, divinely inspired that man does now. I'm not suggesting that any uh, translations are divinely directed by God, but I think he works providentially uh, in terms of chapters. Uh, the longest book is Psalms, or the 150 individual chapters or Psalms. Isaiah comes next. Jeremiah comes next. Now people divided those. Humans divided those into chapters. The Psalms, of course, were written individually, but we'll find out that even some of the Psalms that we have, believe it or not, were even divided. Remember that. File it away. We'll come back to it. Genesis has 50 chapters, but in terms of actual length, Jeremiah is the longest if you're talking about words and letters, not not chapters with 52. Uh, Genesis has 50 chapters, uh, but it actually is second place when it comes to length. Psalms is third, if you're counting words and counting uh, letters. And Ezekiel is fourth, Isaiah fifth, and then the book of Exodus sixth. Uh, but we have five books of Psalms. Five books of uh, Psalms. And so uh, these, these chapters were original, but uh, the other books of the Bible were divided into chapters at different times by different people, divided into verses. For example, Stephanus divided 
uh, the Bible for the first time in verses. For a long time, they just had chapters. But uh, he had the idea, why not, if you're going to refer to the Bible, have it broken down even into smaller segments. And so he, he uh, broke down the New Testament into different verses in 1551 in an edition of his Greek New Testament. And it was the um, Geneva Bible that first, as an English translation, first had verses and chapters. The chapters broken down into verses. So you see it was done at different times to think that uh, uh, Psalm 118 would be the middle chapter. That was not something that anybody human that devised that. That just happened to be because these psalms were uh, originally uh, written individually in psalms. Not true of the rest of the books of the Bible. But psalms was composed of different books originally, five different books. Does anybody know what the five books are, by the way? They're hymn books. And they're divided into uh, original books, manuscripts, and some translations will have that at the top. Uh, book one was... 1 to 41, I can easily remember that, 1 to 41. 42 to 72 is uh, book 2. Book 3 is Psalms 73 to 89. And then 90, obviously, is going to be the beginning of book 4. And if you turn 90 upside down, you'll have a 06. And that's how I remember 90 to 106. And then uh, the last book is Psalms 107 to 150. But you have originally five separate books that make up the Psalms. And of course, each Psalm was originally written as uh, an entity itself. And not all the Psalms were written by King David. I think when I first became a Christian, I always heard David wrote the book of Psalms. And it wasn't until I started studying the book of Psalms that I found out that, that, that David didn't write all the Psalms. Maybe you... Uh, know that. Who wrote the most psalms? David. That's why they always ascribe uh, the book, I think, a lot of times to David. Psalm, uh, 73 psalms specifically in the inscription at the top of each psalm. Not all of them have an inscription, but, but a lot of them do. They have a little inscription atop it. They attribute them specifically, explicitly to King David. But now 12... Psalms are ascribed to Asaph. Anybody know anything about Asaph? Ever heard of Asaph? Well, maybe this would be a good class then, because it's going to be on Asaph a little bit. We're going to look at uh, Asaph. Uh, Eleven Psalms are ascribed to the sons of Korah. Now, this is the guy that rebelled, remember, in the book of Numbers against uh, Moses. Korah, Korah's rebellion. Uh, he died, but apparently his son survived, and so some of his descendants wrote 11 psalms. Two psalms are ascribed to King Solomon, the son of David. And one psalm is ascribed to Moses, Psalm 90. One psalm is ascribed to Ethan, and 50 psalms are anonymous. Interestingly, one-third of the book of Psalms apparently are anonymous because there's no inscription at the top of the psalm telling you who, who wrote it. And sometimes there's a notation about the uh, actual uh, lyric you're supposed to, or, or rather the hymn, the tune you're supposed to use, that's sometimes at the top. Sometimes there's some mention about when David or others wrote it. Now, King David may have written more than 73 psalms, and the reason why I say that, this is... A little interesting fact. First uh, Chronicles chapter 16, you might want to turn there in your Bible, uh, is equal in wording to Psalm 105, verses 1 through 15. Identical in Hebrew and should be in English. If your translation has a difference, it's just because two different people translated them didn't recognize it's the same words, but they're exactly the same words in uh, Hebrew. First Chronicles picking up uh, chapter 16 with verse 16 to 23 is identical to Psalm 96, believe it or not. And 
1 Chronicles 16, 34 to 36 is identical with Psalm 106, verse 1, and then verses 47 to 48. So apparently someone took uh, an original psalm that was an entity, 1 Chronicles 16, verses 8 through 22, and by inspiration now, by inspiration, they divided it into three psalms or hymns. I mean, that's a fact. You can't argue with it. It's a fact. It doesn't mean that the Bible has been altered or changed. Some liberal teacher wants to teach that nonsense might say that. But I mean, this is just a fact. You have to recognize that you have originally one uh, psalm. And who uh, wrote that? Well, chapter uh, 16 verse 7 of 1st Chronicles tells us the author of that psalm David but somebody was it David broke up these other psalms so these other psalms don't have any inscription so we're not sure who divided this up I think it was Asaph 1st Chronicles 16 7 now Asaph wrote psalms and so he was guided by God uh, it, with inspiration, divinely uh, inspired. First Chronicles 16, 7, King David wrote this psalm, all the verses as an entity, First Chronicles 16, 8 through 36, and it had a special day. It was inaugurating the first day of worshiping God after the Ark of the Covenant had been brought to Jerusalem. You can find that in chapter 13. And, uh, of course, there's a problem. Anybody remember the problem when they're bringing the Ark in. Oh yeah, had it on an ox cart. What were they doing having it on an ox cart? Priests are supposed to carry it. Numbers chapter 5, Don. How are they supposed to carry it? Stains, rods. They had rings on the side. They're supposed to put it in rings. Right? Supposed to be carried. Go back and read, uh, I think it's Numbers chapter 5, if I'm not mistaken. Chapter 4, chapter 5, talk about that. Um, but uh, anyway, they're supposed to carry it. Now, what are they doing having it on an ox cart? Why do you think they put it on an ox cart? It's chapter 4. Chapter 4 is where they're supposed to carry it. And uh, they're not supposed to look in it. Numbers chapter 4, verse 20. Not supposed to even touch it. If they touch it, uh, God warns them, uh, verse 15, this is Numbers 4, 15, that they'll die. The Kohathites were supposed to carry it. And uh, if they touch it, uh, it was a holy thing. They're supposed to die. They're not supposed to look in it. Uh, Numbers 4, 20. But uh, people did do that. You have a story of it in 1 uh, Samuel where uh, the Philistines had it. And uh, they didn't want it after they were uh, suffering so much. And so they sent it back to Israel. And uh, we read about uh, the ark coming in to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 6. You might remember the story Uzzah, and he's got it on an ox cart. What are they doing putting it on an ox cart, by the way? Well, they did have it on an ox cart, didn't they? Yeah, I'm getting into another lesson maybe there, but yeah, they uh, had it on an ox cart and they got rid of it. They knew they couldn't touch it and people would be dying. But how'd they get it on that ox cart? when they brought it in Jerusalem. I think they had to use the poles, the staves, to put it on the ox cart. I think they're trying to make it a big procession. And then, believe it or not, you have uh, Uzzah when the uh, oxen stumble. This is uh, 2 Samuel 6 and also the parallel count, 1 Chronicles 13. And uh, when the ox cart stumbles, that's when Uzzah reaches out his hand. I always used to think, man, that was, you know, kind of pretty strict to strike us a day. He's trying to study, steady the ark when I, real, when I realized they're not supposed to even have it on a cart. 
You're not supposed to touch it. They should have known that from Numbers 4. But they're not even supposed to have it on this cart, you know, to begin with. So, you know, what's God supposed to do? I think sometimes we're, we uh, read the Bible. We don't understand maybe what's going on. Maybe think something's unfair. But, you know, what is God supposed to do if he warns people in Numbers 4 and then people disobey? So this, this, uh, this psalm... Uh, that we have in 1 Chronicles 16 was written by David to inaugurate the day after the Ark of Covenant finally was brought. And David placed this psalm into the hand of Asaph, whom he had pointed the head of the music. Now I think he gives it to Asaph. I think it was Asaph that turned it into three different psalms in the book of Psalms. So Asaph uh, is an important person and uh, we're going to look at tonight uh, one of the psalms that he wrote. Now, David wrote 73 psalms, specifically according to the inscriptions, but apparently there's at least three more. But tonight, and we do this, by the way, with hymns. Uh, some of you guys, I don't know if we got Paul or Alan, and maybe somebody else in here that knows, but... You know, the following hymns have at least two different tunes. Rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O men of God. Actually, I think there's a third tune to that. Uh, some of our hymns, we sing them uh, to the same tune. These we sing, these three hymns are sung. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. They're all sung in the same tune. There's nothing inappropriate about that, right? Uh, and so you have people doing that with the Psalms by divine inspiration. They would take even uh, a single Psalm and they would divide it up. Here's the same tune, the Italian hymn, for those. And so we do that with uh, hymns. Now I'd, I'd like for us to turn to Psalm 73. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 73. We've already talked about who Asaph was. Uh, he's uh, an associate of David. Next to David, he wrote more psalms than anyone else. And uh, he was the chief of the musicians. If you go back to 1 Chronicles 16, uh, where you have that entire psalm that we looked at that was divided up into three. And he's a son of Berechiah, a descendant of Gershom, and he's one of the three sons of Levi. You know, you have Gershom, the Kohathites, we've already talked, Merorites, we talked about the, the uh, Kohathites carrying the uh, ark. They all three, the sons of uh, Levi, uh, the Levites had three families and they all had particular responsibilities uh, with the temple or the tabernacle back in the time of Moses. So anyway, this is uh, the family that uh, Asaph is from. He's a Levite from Gershom. And in Psalm 73, Asaph is struggling. I don't know where you are tonight. I've struggled spiritually. I've struggled a lot of times physically and spiritually. I remember a year ago at this time, I was wondering why in the world, you know, did I have to go through this with my shoulder? Uh, it still bothers me, but I can, I can teach a class now, and it's, it, it's always there, I always know it's hurting, but uh, you know, I just struggle. Sometimes you ask God, why in the world? Uh, well, I know why. <laughs> anyway, I won't talk about that. It wasn't it, it having anything to do with God, really, so much. Psalm 73, Asaph is struggling. Now, I want you to listen carefully as we read it. Maybe you follow along in your Bible, if you want. And see if you can tell me at the end of our reading, why? Why is Asaph struggling? Why is Asaph struggling? Let's read it together. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my footing. For I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The wicked have no struggles. 
Their bodies are healthy and strong. They never have any troubles like other men. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, they wear pride like a necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. You'll see a difference sometimes in wording in a translation. Verse 7 is one of them. Uh, I translate it this way. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. We'll talk about it later if you have something different refers to eyes. From their callous hearts, their hard hearts, come evil, iniquity. Evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. Arrogantly, they bully other people. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. And God's people turn to them as if waters of abundance poured forth from them. Even God's people, you know, lap up what they have. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? Does God really know what I'm doing? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. I am plagued all day long and punished every morning. If I had said I will speak as they do, then I would have betrayed this generation of your children. When I tried to understand it all, it troubled me. Until I went to God's temple, God's sanctuary, I now understand their destiny, their end. Surely you set them on slippery places. You cause them to fall to their ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, utterly swept away by terrors. Like a dream from which one awakens, O Lord, when you awaken them. Awaken them at the end of time. You will despise their plans. When my heart was bitter and my insides were pierced through, I was stupid and ignorant. I was like, I was thinking like an animal toward you. Yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom do I have in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire other than you, God. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Behold, those who leave you will perish. You will destroy those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge in order to tell of all your deeds. Who can tell me why, from this reading, Psalm 73, your understanding, and there might be different opinions, but why is Asaph struggling spiritually? What do you think? Prosperity of the wicked. Prosperity of the wicked. He sees the wicked. They're doing pretty good. Okay, why shouldn't, you know, you listen to some of them on TV, you know, all you got to do is send them some money and you, you will prosper, right? Uh, they, they try to get, uh, and there might be, uh, there is something Jesus said, but the measure you use will be measured to you. I don't know if it necessarily is for this particular TV program. There is a principle there. But you know, you look at the, you look at the wicked, I mean, look at myself. I'm out of a job, really. I'm trying to find a job right now, but. You know, uh, there's people who are not as well off. They're struggling financially. They're struggling 
uh, physically, with health. Asaph, he's struggling spiritually. And right, he sees the wicked. How are the wicked? How does he describe the wicked? What does he use for descriptions? Okay, they're wealthy. Do they have any cares? He says they're carefree, doesn't he? What about their bodies? They're healthy. They're not plagued by illness. We've got many people in this church that are sick. We pray for them. You look on the list. Some of them have cancer, struggling, fighting for their life. You look at the wicked. A lot of people look at them and they see, you know, they, uh, they don't really have my struggles. Why, do I have, why does God allow his people to struggle? Yeah, in the back. with an answer, but initially he's struggling in Psalm 73, isn't he? He's, 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 he's envious. He says he's envious. He's jealous. He's envious. He, he wishes that he had the life that they have. Why should the righteous suffer? Why should we be in the situation that we're in? We have God, after all, is in control of everything. If God is in control of everything, why is he letting his people suffer? Why shouldn't we be better off? Do you see the reasoning at least? And, and, and why, are the, why are things the way they are uh, with the people who are trying to please God and trying to live for God? God's causing that? I think a lot of times that's what we do, don't we? We, we are angry really at God in some ways. And I think Asaph is struggling with that. That's, that's what happens when he says, my feet almost, what? what do you, how do you describe it? At the beginning of Psalm 73? Slip, what does that mean? He almost fell away, right? He's thinking about falling away. He thinks it's in vain. In fact, there's a word, a key word in Hebrew. Ah, surely. It, it appears three times, and it's a key, I think, when you look at the psalm, it helps you to kind of zero in on certain verses. Surely God is good to Israel. God's good to those who are pure in heart. Surely He is. God's good to His own people, isn't He? But as for me, you see, He doesn't see Himself in that good situation. He sees other people like we might see other people in the church. Things seem to be going right with them, man. Things are not going right for me. You ever felt that way? You ever, ever felt? Surely God's good to Israel. God is good to His people. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. I had nearly lost my footing for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw that the wicked had what I don't. I don't have what other people in the church have. And I don't have what the wicked have. I, why me? Why am I in this situation? The wicked have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy, strong. They never have any troubles like other men. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, they wear pride like a necklace. They clothe themselves, he says, with violence. They don't treat other people right. But they seem to have everything. And life comes easy. Healthy, strong, wealthy. Surely, verse 13, in vain I have kept my heart pure. What does he mean when he says in vain I've kept my heart pure? How would you rephrase that? He says I've kept my heart pure. Uh -huh. He's wasting his time. He's wasting his time. Am I paraphrasing today? Here I've been faithfully going to church. Not just on Sunday morning, I come on Wednesday night. I come on Sunday night. I raise my hand for the cards. I try to faithfully call people. 
If I have to write and mail a card, I'll send people. You know, I even go get my own cards. Because I don't want them getting this. I get my own cards, my own stamp, and send it to people. I don't even have to get a card to call certain people that I know about and care about and send cards to people. Right? I don't even have to, to be told or be asked. It's all in vain. It's all a waste of time. Can you imagine what that means to say, surely in vain I've been a Christian, in vain I've been faithful to God? Can you imagine where Asaph is spiritually to make a statement like that? God's good to His people, Israel, verse 1. Surely God's good to His people. God's not been good to me. Isn't that what He's saying? God has not been good to me. Have you ever felt that way? I'm not asking anybody to volunteer but there's a <laughs> say that but that is a real serious problem if you ever get to that point you look at the wicked you look at other people you look at people that are not even in the right church they don't care about the right church they don't care about the church their family was in their mom was in they're not even want to listen to you when you try to tell them different but in vain have I kept my heart pure? In vain I have tried to follow God's word. In vain I've tried to worship Him correctly. In vain I've been faithful. I've been wasting my time. Can you see where Asaph is struggling spiritually? You can see why he almost slipped. You know, sometimes people suffer bad things, even good people. You remember the story of Job? We've all studied Job, right? Did Job deserve what happened to him? Do you think Job deserved what happened to him? No. I don't think he did. Did he have some secret sin? Did he have some kind of uh, problem that he was nursing? Did he have an attitude against God in any way? No. He's, he's, he's called a blameless man. He's a blameless man in the Bible. He didn't deserve what all that, that befell him. The Bible says repeatedly in the book of Job, he's blameless. I'm not saying he's sinless, only Jesus was sinless. But of all people living on earth, Job stood out for being a godly man. But you see, it's Satan, if you read the first two chapters, that's targeted Job, not God. God didn't want what's happening to Job to happen to him. It's Satan. I think sometimes we're quick, maybe for where Asaph is, we want to blame God for why things are the way they are. I've heard people, you think, well, God, why is God letting this happen to me? Why did God let this person do to me? Why do I have this disease? Why has God let me fall into this situation? He's in control of everything. Why does He want this to happen to me? It has nothing to do with God. But he's in charge of everything. He's in control of everything. Yeah. But that still doesn't mean that God wants this to happen to you. I think you talked about this, didn't you, in your class? You had a good class on it. God does not want bad things unless he needs to bring us to our senses. And we are involved in some sin. And God wants to show us. Maybe punish us in a way, discipline us in a way. But that wasn't the case with Job. You go back and read Job chapter 1 verse 9. And what does Satan say? Job is a blameless man. God's even bragging on him. But what does Satan say to God? You let me have him. I'll have him cursing you to your face. <laughs> God, I'll have him turn against you. And he will curse you to your face if you let him touch you. Well, you know the story. Satan's plan to get Job to curse God to turn against him. But God has a limit that he places on Satan. That's true for all of us. You know what that is? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has happened to any of us except what's common to man. And God is faithful. He'll not let us be tempted beyond what we're able. But He'll always provide a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. God 
will not let us be tempted. Who does the tempting? We've had that class. Alan's been teaching on James. Who does the tempting? It's not God. It's Satan. Satan has a plan. He's always, he's always working up a plan. And what's really, I think, true in, in Job's case, people have different interpretations, but look at uh, Job 9, verse 6. Job 9, verse 6. If you read the book of Job, you know what happens? Job is blameless at the beginning. But as the book, as you go through it, and some people only read that you like the first two chapters, but if you carefully read the rest of Job, you see Job himself changing. And he begins to blame God. Look at Job 9, 19, verse 6. Job 19, verse 6. There's several verses there. And that's why he needs to repent in chapter 42. Satan always has a plan. In fact, if things are going well for you, if you never have any struggles, if you never have any challenges, that's when you need to worry. Because you know what? Satan doesn't mess with the people that he's already got. He's after the people that he doesn't have. And maybe you show up on his radar because of your influence on other people. That's why he's targeted you. That's why maybe he singled you out in some way. Because he sees the influence you can have on your children, on your grandchildren, on other people that you know, on people in this church, the influence that you have. You need to be aware when things are seemingly going well. Because Satan doesn't mess with the people he already has. Don't fall for his attack. Surely happens in verse 13, verse 1, verse 13, and then notice verse 18. You set them on slippery places. You cause them to fall to their ruin. There's differences sometimes in translation. Um, their eyes stand out with fatness. Their eyes bulge with abundance, some translations. Uh, I think it really means from their callous hearts comes iniquity. There's a difference in Hebrew. I don't know if you can look at that, but there's one letter that's not pulled down all the way. And it ends up being two different letters. That's the difference in those translations sometimes in verse 7. But, but if you try to get a translation, you can use your older translations, but try to get a translation that brings out the thought of it because uh, the point is when... Jo when, when Esau finally sees the end of what happens to these people, he looks at eternity. He looks at his life and their life from eternity. That's when he stops thinking that he's in vain. Is God alone enough? Notice this passage. I know we're out of time. I'm almost about to wrap it up. Whom do I have in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God alone is enough. Heaven alone will be enough. Just imagine this. Imagine a hundred years after the end. Judgment day. And imagine somebody goes up and they've got a microphone, you know, and they go down to Somebody in heaven, you know, they go up to somebody in heaven. Was it worth it? Was it worth everything you had to suffer? Everything you had to sacrifice? Was it worth all of it? Absolutely, man. You wouldn't have to wait a hundred years after the first day, after the first hour. But imagine also somebody goes to the other place and you interview people down there. Was it worth it? Was it worth it always getting your way? Having it easy here on earth? Being wealthy and healthy? And you know, brothers and sisters, that after a hundred years, no, after the first hour, after the first minute, they'll say, no, it wasn't worth it. It was not worth it. God is enough. Heaven is going to be worth it. So my last class, my last encouragement to you, be faithful. Be faithful because it's going to be worth it.